And my goal is not to be the number one, but how can once by the time they've actually clicked on my link, how can I create such a unique experience and offer such a, a compelling uh, offer in the industry that by the time that that person is ready to make a buying decision, they don't have a choice but the one to order for me. Right. So let's say, for example, everybody's selling like, you know, the electric fireplace, everybody's giving free shipping, everybody's selling at the same price. And that's something that everyone's doing. So now I'm just like, hmm, I know I got 30 percent margins. You know, I sell a fireplace for a thousand bucks. I'm OK with giving them five percent off. Like I can live with that. And I see no one else is giving five percent off. So now it's just like, OK, if this customer is genuinely interested in buying the product and I've done all the other conversion rate optimization things with building out a nice site, making sure it's user friendly, all those different dynamics. Now it's coming down to who has the best offer. So if I'm giving five percent and nobody else is giving five percent. Why wouldn't they want to buy from me instead of my competitor? My site looks great, has good speed. You know, um, I got the uh, same product images that came from the uh, supplier that are looking great. You know, same or very awesome product description. Now I got to find a way to give myself an edge. And that's one of the things I do first before I do anything else. Hello, this is Eric from iStack Training. I want to welcome you to a very special episode of The Robust Marketer. First, I wanted to take a quick note and just let you guys know uh, the tickets for e-commerce mastery live in Barcelona, July 20th, were about halfway sold out already. It's amazing. Uh, so, you know, the pickup has been great. Pe more and more people are buying every week. But if you want to come to this event, the premier event, premier European e-commerce event, see the likes of Tim Bird and uh, the Tans and Ezra Firestone and, and some other great people, uh, Greta and Rose Van Riel, we're going to be announcing more speakers soon. You got to get your tickets soon. Uh, it's going to be a blast. So anyway, on with the podcast, episode number 31. I am super lucky today to have Ernest Epps on the podcast with me today. I met Ernest in Bangkok when he came to speak at Affiliate World Asia. Uh, and I could just tell this guy was legit right away. We hit it off, had a few drinks, had a few chats. It was, uh, it was, it was awesome. So Ernest is an expert at e-commerce, high ticket e-commerce drop shipping, but not through the traditional means, not through the means that you're seeing the masses flood into right now. So he's not really using AliExpress. He's, you know, and he's finding means other than Facebook to, to drive the success of his stores. Um, he, he's building out a, a bit of an educational empire as well. He's a super great guy. Welcome to the podcast. Ernest, how are you doing today? Hey, man. Appreciate you guys having me on. And I am absolutely spectacular. Good. Well, that's fantastic. Where are you calling from today? You're in the States, right? Yes. Yeah, so I'm actually, uh, believe it or not, if you look me up, you'll be like, where the heck does this guy actually live at? But contrary to belief, I'm actually at home right now. Uh, so I am back in uh, Virginia. That's where I actually live at. But I'm actually going uh, to New Jersey this weekend. I just came back from Atlanta. And yeah, I just been all over the place. I'm not sure if you guys can see the video, but you know, I just came back from Bali. I was out there uh, with another group helping them run a mastermind event in Indonesia. So, yeah, man, we're just letting it rip, just serving the, the, the world right now in the best way possible to help people get results. How do you, you know, I think we all have different ways of talking about it. How do you talk about this? Oh, that was some, some crazy feedback there. How how do you go about conceptualizing and how do you talk about what's happening in the world right now? Like not not necessarily the craziness that's happening uh, you know, militarily or anything like that. But the, in terms of the opportunity that people have right now to sell things online, to to apply creativity and their craftiness, their marketing skills in order to to create amazing lives for themselves, amazing incomes for themselves. Like, what, what, how do you conceptualize the time that we live in right now when you talk about it? Oh, my gosh, man, there, there's never been a better season to create massive success for yourself. I mean, and I'm not just saying that to be like hokey dokey, like, oh, rah, rah, you know, like literally, I mean, it's just such a great opportunity to be able to really take control of your life and get however much of the pie that you want for yourself. You know, if you look at like, you know, online marketing, affiliate marketing, e-commerce, you know, there's literally billions of dollars in transactions happening annually. Actually, uh, the U.S. Census Bureau uh, said by the year 2020, just in e-commerce alone online, there's going to be six hundred billion dollars in transactions happening by 2020. So we're just talking about e-com. You tie that with affiliate marketing. You tie that with, you know, just creating an online business for yourself. And you're talking about a trillion dollar industry. So. I know a lot of people right now, um, they're really like, oh, my gosh, you know, so many people are starting to come into the marketplace. Can can I still make money? Can I still create opportunity? And it's just 
there's so much pie, it's kind of hard not to. <laughs> yeah. Really. And, and the part of it that I like is, is that as we practice more and more sort of like better marketing tactics, as we improve, as we get smarter, it makes the pie bigger in a way too, right? Because more and more retailers are putting their products, more and more retailers are realizing, wow, there's this class of people that have this amazing expertise at how to market my products. I can go to them. So it's sort of like, yeah, there's a, there's enough pie to go around, but it's like as more good people get into the space, the pie actually gets bigger as well, which is sort of a unique spot. Absolutely, because you you create that opportunity of like, you know, especially like with the offline world and how that works with like, you know, word of mouth, like that stuff really happens, like contrary to belief, because most people think that, you know, you got to just focus everything just online and like, you know, let's forget about the customer experience. Like most people are just looking at selling a product or, or moving inventory or something of that nature. But that offline experience of like the word of mouth, like really is, is something that's still tried and true in the industry and will carry your business like way further than you could possibly imagine uh, if you focus on having that good customer relationship and that that key component. And like you said, having better people in the industry too. Like I know if you guys are listening to this right now and you're following Eric and you're following everything that him and his organizations are doing, like, man, these guys know what they're doing. They're on top of their stuff. They're giving you guys real deal content information. Like you said, just a little plug, man, get out to the event in Europe. I mean, do whatever you can because you will not regret it. I promise you with every fiber of my being because I know those guys. Like I know the people that they're bringing in. I know the quality of information that they're giving you. And if you take that and apply it, I mean, there's absolutely nothing you can't achieve. Yeah, he didn't even pay for that, guys. I mean, and the thing is, Eric, I can say that because I know, right? So um, there was a post that I recently did on my Facebook where I talked about how I went down to uh, just recently. I just came back from Atlanta. But if you rewind just, you know, two, three years ago, I'd actually went down to Atlanta because there was another similar event where there were high caliber people that were coming in, uh, sharing some really good content information. And the only thing I could afford at that point in time before the success was I could only afford to get the ticket. Like I made the decision because I knew I needed to get myself in the environment. So I bought the ticket. And then as I got closer to the environment, I'm just like uh, closer to the event. I was like, man, how the heck am I going to get there? Like, you know, I can either, you know, pay for gas or, you know, I'm like literally like, can I, can I pay for gas? Can I buy a hotel? Like, can I buy food? So I didn't have enough money. Literally, it was a decision between gas or hotel. Right. And so obviously the gas was important because I needed to get there. And so I literally took the money that I would have went towards like a hotel, which actually wasn't much. And I bought a loaf of bread, some peanut butter and jelly, a bag of chips and a case of water. And I literally slept in my car the entire week. And I was washing up in the bathroom, um, you know, just so I could be able to be fresh and stuff like that to actually make it out to the two days that the engagement was. But the thing was, I knew just by showing up that I would get just enough for what I needed to get to that next step in my business from a personal standpoint and from an information applicable standpoint. And I was willing to make that sacrifice. So now you fast forward three years later and I flew down to Atlanta first class you know, I stayed in the number one hotel that's rated in Atlanta right now. And, you know, I'm hanging out with the top entrepreneurs in the globe uh, that's doing big things out here. So it's just like, you know, just a couple of years. So the thing is that I want you guys to get out of that is that, you know, you don't always have to have like the resources and tools to get like start with what you got. Right. And sometimes you're going to have to make a tough decision. Now, I'm not telling everybody to you know go out and take your money to pay your bills and fly out to Europe to hang out with Eric because he's amazing and the people are amazing. If you have to do that, I'm telling you and you take action from the content information that you're getting, you will be able to get a return on that for years and years and years and years to come. Amazing. So what was that? Like, if, do you remember that, that, that moment, you know, you say you go to that, you go to that conference where you literally were, were, you know, working out of your car basically to get there. Do you remember what it was that took you to that next level? Was it a contact that you made? Was it a specific piece of information? Was it three pieces of information? Like where were you before that? And then what, like, what really got you launched into, into the success that you're seeing today? So for me, like it, it goes back to really, uh, I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday, the exact date, like the feeling it was September 2nd, 2015 for me. And that's where I just made the decision where I said, I just got to do something else more for my family. Right. Um, at that point I was really coming out of, so I had gotten uh, fired from a company that I was working for, for a couple of years. And it literally broke me like, like spiritually, like, 
I went into a state of depression, you know, for like the next two years. I kind of spent all the money that I had saved. I was just kind of walking around like a zombie, just like not knowing what I wanted to do for my do for myself for my life. And, you know, I wasn't really able to help out my family because we had two kids, third kid on the way. And I'm just like, I need to do something different. And if I go and chase this corporate dream that I had before, because I climbed the ladder pretty rapidly and I knew how to get results in that world. But I just felt like I couldn't go back there. And that's what I was trying to do for a couple of years was just find myself. And I said, I got to do something. And that's when I actually ran across that stat I told you about with the U.S. Census Bureau was actually a couple of years ago um, when I seen that forecast. And I was like, man, like, I don't know a whole lot about this whole online thing, but I'm pretty sure I could like mess around and get like point zero 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 one percent and still make a couple million dollars. <laughs> right. <laughs> like I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm like, I'm pretty sure I can figure out how to put the pieces to the puzzle together. And there's people that's out there that solve this. So I started to do my due diligence and do research and go to events and surround myself with other people that were actually creating success in this arena. And uh, it took me. So I made a decision. This was September 2nd, 2015. And I actually launched my e-commerce store within 22 days. So from 2009 to 2015, I tell people what I really did was I kind of poked at the industry. I poked at affiliate marketing. I poked at e-commerce. It was kind of like a hobby because I thought I had it made in corporate. Right. And so when I got fired, like that broke me. And like I went through that season and it took me 22 days to launch my store when I said I wanted to get serious. And uh, within 24 hours of launching the business, I was able to get a sale for like 340 bucks. And I was like, oh, my God, this stuff works. (laughs) It works when you work it. And that that was for me, man. It was a mental thing. Right. Uh, a mental thing in my ability to actually hold my hold myself accountable to the information that I already acquired and put the actual work in to make it happen. It's a really cool story. And it's basically you, you 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 jumped in, started selling products, and you jumped in with a high ticket price. If your first ticket, if your first item that you sold was three hundred and forty five bucks, that's it's a cool approach because you know you hear a lot of people talk about AOV and how you know the prices on Facebook and. All these different places, you know, you have to have a high AOV, you have to have, you know, good upsell, uh, you know, upsell capabilities and things like that. But why not just start with higher ticket products or higher disposable income audience targeting? It's a it's a, a logical and simple approach that I feel like you took. What sort of led you to that conclusion? Yeah. So, you know, I will say like a little bit of like kind of the corporate side of things, because I actually worked as a marketing director and sales director and I sold products from all different spectrums. Like I worked on projects with Duracell, AT&T, Walmart and the remodeling industry. And, you know, I did I created some modern success in that world. And one of the things I just knew was the fact that, OK, um, you know, in all the different industries that, you know, if I if I focused on and targeted people that, again, like you mentioned, had higher disposable income, it's not that hard to get money from someone that already has it, right? They already have it. They're not stressing about it. They're not really, you know, obviously they're going to do their due diligence and stuff like that. But if I'm going to sell something to someone, I'd rather sell it to someone that could afford it versus someone that I have to like negotiate with and like give discounts and coupons and all this other nonsense. Right. And I knew specifically with people that were in that upper middle class disposable income, you know, between the ages of like 30 to 50, like that was like a sweet spot. Right. So I was just like, all right, let's start there. But along with that, out of all the research I was doing, I was like, hold on, let me think about this whole equation with the physical products. Like like to sell thousand dollar product, I'm still going to have to build a website. I'm still going to have to drive traffic. I'm still going to have to learn how to market. I'm still going to have to learn how to advertise. I still got to do conversion rate optimization. And it just made sense to be like, why not try to find other products that people are looking for that just cost more, right? <laughs> like the demand could be the same for that as it is for, you know, like a fidget spinner, right? If we compare the two, like if you use a, a tool called Google Keyword Planner, right? You'll see that you do research on fidget spinners. And I'm not sure exactly what that number is, but let's just say hypothetically it's at, you know, 200,000 people looking for a fidget spinner every single month, right? Well, I know specifically for an electric fireplace, there's 200,000 people that look for that product every single month too. The average price point that you can sell a fidget spinner for is like 10, maybe 20 bucks. Electric fireplace is like 600 to 800. And they actually get all the way up to three or 4,000, right? So I'm just like, hold on, same metrics. is the only difference is a different product. I still got to do the same work. So that, you know, my mind just kind of likes to break things down and kind of keep it simple. And if I could do, uh, you know, the same amount of work, but make more money, I'd rather sign up for that. <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I think so many people jump into the game and, 
and they think about models where it, I think it's it's not as as popular now, but they're like the free plus shipping, and then you you make money on the upsells, and it's really like scratching and clawing for people who are making uh, you know conspicuous consumption purchases, right? Like they're people who are maybe you know the, the the price is so low that they're not thinking about about their disposable income even at that point. But yeah, why not move up the chain? you know, target people with disposable income looking for, for these types of products. Now, then with this kind of marketing, you know, there's you, you've also taken a different approach than most. You're not flipping stuff from from AliExpress. How do you go about with these higher ticket items uh, finding the, you know, the drop shipping opportunities that, that, you, that you need? Because you don't you know, you don't want to you're still not holding inventory in your in your organization, right? Absolutely. You're correct, man. So everything I do is all drop shipping. Uh, so the thing is that most people don't realize with a lot of these brands that are out here specifically, like, you know, the brands that you're most likely going to contact if you're selling like in the U S is that in the U S marketplace there, a lot of companies are now understanding the concept of drop shipping, right? They're seeing brick and mortars fall apart. Like Toys R Us, Macy's is closing down a bunch of businesses. Kmart's going bankrupt. Sears is not doing good. You know, so like with all those different dynamics, like they understand that, but they still got to move inventory at the end of the day. Somebody's got to get paid. Right. So now they've actually been a lot more open minded to working with uh, websites and people like, you know, myself and you guys that are listening that are interested in helping them generate more revenue and sending the product directly to the consumer. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, uh, on your end, they just want to make sure that you're a legitimate like company. So that you're, they're going to want to see a website. They're going to want to see that you're a registered business, stuff like that. But you just put those a couple different elements in place. You can call up practically, uh, you know, I can't say really like every company, but almost any company at this point and say, hey, you know, my name is Ernest and I own electricfireplacesusa.com. We're looking to expand our current product catalog. And, you know, we've done some research on your brand and we think it would be great for us to carry your products because we're already targeting the people that are looking for exactly what you want to sell. Right. And we're just looking to uh, to see how we could go about setting up a dropship account. And by, by positioning yourself that way, and then, you know, having a site set up, you know, having a domain already. And then they see like, you know, the other dynamics that you're niche specific, you're driving their, you know, direct uh, targeted traffic to your website already. It just makes sense for them. It's a win win. And, and they're not losing anything in the process. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty much, you know, that simple as I, you know, after I do the research and figure out like, you know, I want to sell these products. I just pick up the phone and call those guys directly. And well, pretty much with that same conversation piece, the challenge is right now, Eric, is that most people don't even realize that companies out here are actually, they're not actively looking because they're doing okay. They're moving inventory through Target and Walmart and Amazon and places like that. But they're really open-minded at this point to be able to work with online retailers, you know, if you approach them in the right way. And approaching them in the right way here involves, you got to have a brand, you got to, mm-hmm. you, you got to look legit. You got to, you got to express yourself well. Um, how many, like, it's, it's it's so how much work goes it's, it's first of all do you use shopify are you uh is shopify on your back end or what do you actually use to build yes. your sites yep you're absolutely right i, I recommend shopify because it's just so simple uh you know it's plug and play like you you know it'd be it'd be really hard not to be able to figure out how to use shopify especially with all the security like they give you so much security like it's crazy like what, what they support you with um you know on the back end of your site so yeah i, I recommend shopify for sure Nice. And then let's talk about your chosen methods of promotion, because I, you know, a, a lot of people in our field are all about Facebook ads. They're all about, um, you know, slamming up some video ads. There's a very, you know, s- s- protocol for generating engagement through to, you know, add to carts through to conversions and building your audience and your lookalike pixel, all this stuff. But again, people's costs are going up and up and up on Facebook. Brand dollars are flooding in, uh, you know, increasing those costs. Uh, white hat e-commerce stuff is being wiped out. On a, on a daily basis on Facebook because of all the heat that Facebook is taking. And uh, so, so talk to me about, about how you arrived at your, your choice for distribution and, and then talk about what your distribution mix looks like now. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with high ticket e-commerce, you know, the thing is when you're looking at selling a product that's like 600, 800, a thousand, you know, you know, I had an order that came in last night at like 11 o'clock last night, $2,500, right? Like, how do you find someone like that that's looking for what you want to sell, that's willing to take action pretty quickly? This lady had like three touches on my website and she converted for a $2,500 order, right? So the thing is, like, you got to look at when people are comparing Facebook right now to, you know, uh, let's say like Google, for example, uh, contrary to belief, number one, what you got to realize is that Facebook actually isn't the most visited website in the world, contrary to belief. Like most people think they are but they actually aren't. They're actually number three. 
right? Google's number one, YouTube's number two, and Facebook's number three, right? So just looking at that and me kind of just doing some research on that before I decided to like put some money into advertising, I was like, holy smokes, man, like Facebook isn't even like chilling it like Google is. Like that same year, I think it was 2000, uh, like roughly I, I seen the numbers from like 2015, 2016 and Google, they did $72 billion in advertising and Facebook did like six. I was like, all right, hold on. Like maybe I should be playing over here where everyone else isn't talking about. And then I started to do some more digging. I was just like, okay, so when I go to set up advertising on Facebook, I got to really position my ad to disrupt the person that's scrolling, number one, first to capture their attention. Then number two, I'm really, I'm essentially trying to convince them to get something that they're not even actively looking for. And for me personally, I'm like, that's going to be a hard sell for somebody like for a thousand dollars, like, you know, twenty dollars, forty dollars, even a hundred dollars, especially when you're targeting the right uh, demographics. That's not too bad. But I'm like a thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars. That's a conversation you got to have, like with your significant other. Like you guys got to talk about it. Like you're in a different place when you look at something like that. So I said, well, it, it's probably going to cost me more money to acquire that customer on a long term basis than what it would if I were able to get in front of people that are actively looking for what I'm selling. And I realized that that's what Google presented uh, from a high ticket perspective is the fact that, you know, when you look at someone that's going to Google, they're going to the search engine, like searching for something that they're that's of interest to them. So if I can, you know, and the other part too, is I love that you can control the type of traffic that you can drive to Google. Like you can say, hey, only send me people that are actually looking for the brands I carry and exclude everything else. Only send me traffic for people that are looking for what I'm selling. I was like, man, that's pretty cool. And the other fact is that, uh, especially with Google PLAs, that's the shopping section on Google, is the fact that by the time someone actually clicks on that photo, like they're already intrigued about the product. They've already put it in, number one, because if someone goes and says, I'm looking for an Amante electric fireplace, Google's only showing them electric Monty electric fireplace. They're not going to show them, you know, kitchen tables, right? <laughs> so Google's going to put that right product in front of the right customer. And I was just like, that made sense if like, I'm just getting in front of people that are actively already lo- uh, looking for what I'm selling. And the fact that now when you look at like a sales funnel per se, and you look at, you know, I'm not going to get into like the depths of that. You guys will get a ton more information from Eric and go to Europe. You'll get a lot of information there too, right? <laughs> but if you look at like a sales funnel, when someone's already putting in exactly what they're looking for and getting your product in front of them. Like they're already more so at the end of the buying cycle to make a decision for that product. So you get someone like that to your website and they might not necessarily buy right then and there. But again, just like Facebook, how you can put a pixel on your site, Google has a pixel that you can install too. And you can remarket to that person through Google's uh, search display network and literally just follow them around the internet until they're ready to make a buying decision. And retargeting is going to be way cheaper than even that first initial click that you got when you originally drove them to your website. Amazing. And you're going up against actual brands too, right? Like you're in this case, you're going to be, your, your ad is going to be featured next to the company you might even be drop shipping from, or like, you know, in, in a lot of cases, which is, which is an interesting position because when, when Google shows all these products, it's like a total equal playing field, right? It, it, oh, your yeah. product gets put right beside the billion dollar brand that's that's right there. And and th- then there's an opportunity for them to, to visit your site. So again, you have you have to have that tight and everything. But what what what, what like what do you use to get an edge with, with Google PLA? Like if it seems like it equalizes the playing field so much, is it just a matter of clever bidding? Is it a matter of just having a whole sales funnel r- with retargeting built in? But like what are the key ways you get an edge using these these product placement ads with Google's with Google? Yeah. So, um, you know, I would love to like give you guys like the full presentation because I actually uh, I came up with a concept called value stacking, what I do uh, for high ticket e-com. Right. And uh, there's an entire process that kind of goes through that. But getting to the nitty gritty, one of the first things I just told myself essentially with the whole concept is, is how can I create more value on my store than what my competitors are offer? So I look at number one first is I do competitive analysis on everyone else that's selling the exact products that I'm already selling. Like, what are they doing right now? How many reviews are they getting? Like, what's the products that's currently selling? What's happening in the reviews? Like, what are people saying as far as experience? What's happening over at Amazon and, and, you know, Target and Walmart, all that good stuff. And then now my goal is number one, I want to model what they're doing first because they're doing it because obviously it's working. But the second thing is like, how can I create that edge for myself? 
Like, what can I do that's just a little bit more? So for me personally, my approach with advertising is a whole lot different than when you go to most media buyers. Like most media buyers, they're like, we got to spend here, we got to spend there, we got to spend, we got to spend, 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 right? And if you're getting a good, uh, you know, conversion rate, spend some more, right? And that's totally cool and fine. But my goal has always been like, how can I create such a unique experience on my site so that by the time they actually click, because my goal isn't even to be number one. My goal isn't to spend as much as I possibly could to get to that number one spot. My goal is like, how can I play there with everybody else? But by the time they get to me, because again, people are going to shop around. They're going to do their comparison analysis. They'll like see you and you have the same price as three other people, but they'll probably click through all three, four, five, you know, six ads. Right. And my goal is not to be the number one, but how can once by the time they've actually clicked on my link, how can I create such a unique experience and offer such a a compelling uh, offer in the industry that by the time that that person is ready to make a buying decision, they don't have a choice but to want to order for me. Right. So let's say, for example, everybody's selling like, you know, the electric fireplace, everybody's giving free shipping, everybody's selling at the same price. And that's something that everyone's doing. So now I'm just like, hmm, I know I got 30 percent margins. You know, I sell a fireplace for a thousand bucks. I'm OK with giving them five percent off. Like I can live with that. And I see no one else is giving 5% off. So now it's just like, okay, if this customer is genuinely interested in buying the product and I've done all the other conversion rate optimization things with building out a nice site, making sure it's user friendly, all those different dynamics. Now it's coming down to who has the best offer. So if I'm giving 5% and nobody else is giving 5%, why wouldn't they want to buy from me instead of my competitor? My site looks great, has good speed. You know, um, I got the uh, same product images that came from the uh, supplier that are looking great. You know, same or very awesome product description. Now I got to find a way to give myself an edge. And that's one of the things I do first before I do anything else. That's really smart. I've been in those funnels, those Google product funnels where you're, you're looking at product after product. And it gets to the point you're just looking for a reason. Like, give me a reason. Give me a reason to make this purchase. It's the thing that can kind of like tip you over the edge especially if it's a conspicuous, it's a purchase that you're, you know, you're maybe doing on a whim or it's a little bit more of a, of a, you know, impulse purchase. Uh, you're looking for just a reason, just give me a reason to go with you. And, and a 5% could, could definitely be it. Right. Oh yeah. 5%, especially on like a thousand, 2000 bucks. Like now it's like 50, a hundred, $200 that people are saving. It's just like, wow, you're willing to give me 200 bucks. I'm like, and me at the end of the day, like I'd, I'd be okay still making, you know, on a thousand dollar purchase, I got 40% margin. You know, I'd give away 50 bucks and still make 350. I made $350 doing nothing, <laughs> right? Uh, after I get the order, I'm just clicking forward and the manufacturer's doing all the work. So I'm okay living with that at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. And, and so most of these manufacturers are shipping from the United States in the most part. So you don't have any of the issues that you have with AliExpress in terms of two month shipping times or, or, and also it's a higher ticket item. So maybe there's some expectation that it might take a little longer. How does how does shipping times work in your business and how are the how, how does it differ from the your average alley drop shipper? Oh yeah, absolutely, man. The lead times are way, way quicker. Like I'm getting the same lead times that Amazon, Walmart, Home Depot, all their this we have the same exact lead times on the products. Like if they were to order from Home Depot, they're gonna get in the same exact time for me. If they say they'll get it to you by Wednesday, it'll be there by Wednesday for me too as well, because we're dealing with the same exact manufacturer. And most people don't even realize that even big box retailers are transitioning a lot now towards the whole drop shipping business model. Uh, a lot of them don't even carry inventory in their actual warehouses. I know I was looking on, um, there's actually a way to be able to distinguish. I figured it out on a couple of different websites. Um, I know with, man, I think it was like Ace Hardware. I was on their website and I was getting, and I was going to order something. And, um, there was specific language that was actually on the product page. And I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I called them up and it was just like, Hey, you know, how soon was this going to come in? They're like, Oh, this is going to have to come from the manufacturer's warehouse. We don't carry this in any of our retail stores in the country. I was like, Oh wow. Like that, that intrigued me. So I'm like, so you guys are moving away from drop shipping. Like a good way to tell, like with home Depot, if you go to the reviews and you see the reviews are branded from like the specific brand, that means that in most cases, they're probably drop shipping that product because they don't even have reviews for it. They're actually borrowing the reviews from the actual manufacturer themselves. So that's another way to figure out on a Home Depot site. So, uh, so yeah, it's crazy, man. A lot of people are starting to really leverage uh, drop shipping, even the big box retailers now. So along with PLA, along with PLA uh, what other strategies are you employing to, to acquire new customers? Yeah, so me, I just focus on search engine traffic. So I'm using... Uh, Google product listing ads. I'm using Bing product listing ads. 
Uh, you know, I'm running uh, search text ad campaigns on Yahoo, Bing, Google, uh, dynamic retargeting through Google. So, yeah, it's just mainly just all search engine traffic. I'm like anti-Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you could still be doing retargeting on Facebook pretty effectively, I imagine. Yeah, I, you know what? I thought about doing that, too. But, you know, my whole uh, like I've kind of gotten like this whole like industry, like cool thing because I'm not running Facebook ads. And I was just like, man, that's awesome. Like I come on stage and they're like, this guy doesn't run Facebook ads. And everyone's like, oh, I'm just like, oh, maybe I should not run Facebook ads. But I'm, pr- I'm probably leaving like another like 10, 15 percent like, you know, uh, growth that I'm, you know, could, could acquire if I go on Facebook. But right now I'm trying to stay off Facebook. <laughs> you got to weigh the value of your persona with the value of that retargeting <laughs> avenue there. That's uh that's an interesting one, but your persona is, is going pretty well as well. Like, obviously, you know, you're just meeting people. People love you when, when they meet you, you're just such an open, honest guy. Uh, and, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad to see that part of the business, uh, going really well for you as well. I wanted to ask you though, what are some other, so you've got a 5% discount. Are, are there other things that you can do in that value stacking process to set your, set yourself apart from, from your competitors in that space? What, what are other tactics? Yeah. So like uh, some of the other tactics will fall down, like really working with like your manufacturer, because like they could have some flexibility with working with you where, you know, they could possibly like get the product out, uh, you know, at a sooner time. Like I know like my processing times in the warehouse from my different manufacturers. So like I can say, you know, expedited processing if you order today. Right. And that's something I can really genuinely do, because I know if I get the order in before, you know, 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time or seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, that that order can get processed quicker. And the funny thing is, is that uh, your competitors don't even do any of that stuff. Like if you go to Walmart, like you don't see anything like that. Like aside from like the generic stuff that they're doing, like site wide, you don't really see like unique elements of like, you know, expedited processing speed. Now, someone that's done a really good job of it is like Amazon where they have like the countdown timer. So it's just like, again, like if you're not doing something like that, why aren't you doing something like that? And the reason why you're probably not is, you know, if you're, especially if you're drop shipping from AliExpress, like you're trying to get the product there under 30 days, like that's a challenge, right? <laughs> so you can't even offer something like that to your customers. So, you know, I'm able to do things like that because I have that direct relationship with the manufacturer. You know, I can, you know, upgrade the shipping, um, you know, from just being like curbside delivery where they drop it off at your mailbox to say, hey, we're going to do door to door delivery where we we'll actually bring it to the entry point of your door or we'll drop it off on the inside for you if you're home. Right. You can't offer things like that if you're not able to do it. I know one of the other things I've done, too, is that, you know, some of my competitors, they'll actually charge for like the extended warranties. Right. So let's say a product comes with like or not necessarily an extended warranty, but the lifetime of the warranty. So a product will come with like a three year warranty. Right. And so, you know, I know that they know that. But most products you would think typically come with like a one year warranty. That's the general like life shelf expectancy when you buy a product you know, especially when it's coming directly from the manufacturer one year. So they'll put on their store that they'll charge like 50, 75, a hundred dollars for a three-year warranty when the product already comes with a three-year warranty. <laughs> now that's kind of getting to more of like, you know, gray hat, kind of black hat a little bit. Right. Um, when, when you're charging the customer for something that they're initially kind of getting, but me personally, like I took that same content and information. Now I position it in my product description where I say, hey, we're going to give you a free three-year warranty. And then I list what the value of that would be, you know, based off of my competitor or based off of if you were to go out and contact the company to get like a service-based warranty and say, you know, $200, $300 value that you're getting from me versus from my competitor. Uh, I had, so I had a question here. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons people love Facebook ads is that ability, the unparalleled ability to scale and and to hit the gas on things. Uh, and, and that's, and, you know, coming from an affiliate background, these, these guys love to be able to hammer things hard. Uh, I'm talking with Nick Shackelford and his story around pup socks about being able to spend, you know, millions of dollars over oh, short periods sure. of days in order to like, drive incredible results. I wanted to ask about the model that you operate with and how it scales, like how many different stores you sort of have active, like what, what's your sort of like business plan when it comes to scaling this model? Yeah, man. So really like with uh, with high ticket, you know, I've broken it down into like two different ways to to really scale the business, because essentially my goal when I open up a store and I'm, I'm selling in a particular niche is to really dominate that market. Right. So like, again, just using the electric fireplaces, like my goal is to dominate the industry with electric fireplaces. So you got two ways of scale and you can scale 
you know, horizontal, what I look at, you know, adding more brands and more products, right? Um, because the more brands that you have, again, that people are actively already looking for, naturally, the more traffic and naturally the more sales, right? That's just going to happen because you got more brands that people are already looking for. So it's like the easiest way. So for me, I've, I've tracked the numbers every time on a store that I add on average about three to four brands to the actual storage self, self I typically can bring in an extra eight to 15% increase month over month once all the products have actually been uploaded to the store. So I'm like, I can give myself a pay raise like once I acquire more brands for that particular industry. Um, and so, you know, you'll have a team of VAs that'll do that. I highly recommend you don't do that yourself, especially once you start making some money, outsource that bad boy. Cause that is the one thing I think, uh, it's like the lowest paid thing you could do on the schedule. Right. Uh, and then the other aspect too, is like, you know, scaling, uh, vertically, which is like adding more, you know, different, um, you know, doing more media buying. So figuring out other channels and stuff that you can acquire more customers from. And so essentially like, you know, my goal is always to figure out, you know, where are most of the buyers coming from. And, uh, you know, ultimately that's going to be Google because that's where, you know, majority of the search volume is from. And you can do the research using Google Keyword Planner and Bing's Keyword Planner and kind of figure that out. So it's just like, all right, once you kind of get things going and you're creating a decent ROI, you know, let's say $20 a day, $50 a day. It's just a matter of just, you know, increasing that daily spend. which is going to bring in more traffic. Then once you really get a good, you know, conversion rate ROI on that channel, just moving on to the next one and modeling what you're already doing. Because the unique thing about Google, Bing, and Yahoo is that you can actually uh, take and copy pretty much the same campaign structure that you're doing on one channel to the next. And it's pretty simple to be able to model that through the different channels. So it's just like, just really just kind of turning that bad boy up. And as many people are looking every single day is as much traffic as you'll be able to bring in. And again, it's, 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 it's steady and it's not on the back of Facebook. You're not getting, you're not, you're not getting your accounts banned or anything like that. It's uh it's sort of steady and, and, and slow. It does, you know, you're not going to be able to spend a million in a day necessarily uh, exactly. you know, unless it's Black Friday, maybe, or, so, you know, a big day and you, you're selling instant pots for the first time. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, because I know you, you, t- you talk a lot about like finding niches and, and how to find good niches and stuff like that. I feel like we're, we're headed to such interesting times in the world and potentially scary times right now with uh, global conflict on the rise and all of these things. Uh, but I, I just I wanted to put your put put your Nostradamus hat on a little bit and and talk about like given the world sort of climate that we're that we're in right now, what are some areas and niches that you think might over the next like year or two, uh, you know, hold some promise? Not to put you totally on the spot, but uh. <laughs> yeah, no, man. For me personally, like the thing is, is that when it comes to like product ideas, you got to look at stuff that's always like tried and true, that's never going to go anywhere. Like with like, no matter how the market is, no matter if it's like global warming, no matter if there's like, you know, uh, something detrimental that happens, like, you know, no matter if like, you know, Trump does something crazy, it won't matter. Right. You know, so something like, you know, just using the example of like a fidget spinner, like, you know, that's something like, yeah, you'll be able to make some good money off of. But for me personally, I would have never sold their product in the first place. Because one of the first things that I do before I decide to go into a particular niche or sell a particular product is that I use a tool called Google Trends, right? And I look at how long has the demand been in the market before I even decide to sell this product. Something like a fidget spinner, you know, just came into the marketplace like two, three, maybe four years ago. So I would have never like hedged all my energy, time and effort on a product like that. Because for me, by the time I set up a store, I want to be able to set it up for long term success. I want to be able to, you know, when I'm sitting back and I'm like flying all over the place, like I've done a couple of screenshots where I'm just stepping off the plane, $5,000 this process. It's just like, well, how can you just sit back and like let that come in and just know that you're going to have consistent revenue month over month? Well, it's because the products that I always look to sell are always in demand annually. Like they're always in demand either annually or I know with the season in which I can maximize and create, you know, massive success with. And using Google Trends, using Google Keyword Planner, like I mentioned earlier before, you can do that research ahead of time to really know, like, hey, are people really looking for these products and how long have they been actually doing it? So, uh, you know, those those are the things I look at the most. And as far as like certain industries, man, I mean, let's just look at uh, one of the ones that I love a lot because I've just seen more and more people go into the niche and just massive amount of people create success. And most people have no idea, you know, especially in the e-commerce world, we really don't share like the exact stores and products we're selling, but like the pet industry, right? I've seen so many people like crush it in the pet industry because 
people are always going to have pets. And like when people have pets, they're always going to buy stuff for their pets. Like they're going to need, you know, the dog food, the dog cage, like, you know, the cat tree, um, you know, all the different, you know, types of products that go into that from a physical product standpoint. And then you got like the other side with the like the apparel side of things, too. Like people are always going to buy like the cool cat shirt, the cool dog shirt. And, you know, I just even heard a statistic the other day when I was at an event where, you know, uh, it was said that uh, people that own uh, dogs on average typically spend more money on their dog's health insurance and then their own personal health insurance. Right. And I was like, holy moly, that's crazy. <laughs> right. So if I'm going to sell a product, like, you know, that's another industry I'm looking at going into is like the pet industry. Right. Cause there's just so much opportunity. There's literally, if you do the research, there's billions of dollars in transactions happening on an annual basis that if you were to go into that market or you look at like going into like a hobby industry, People are always going to naturally want to do like hobby related stuff. Like people are always going to continue surfing. People are always going to continue to do, you know, biking, uh, triathlons. Like people are always going to want to stay fit. They're going to need, you know, different products to be able to do that. So I look at always going into markets and industries that they're not going to go anywhere no matter what. Like the cool stuff that comes out, look at the hoverboard example. You know, that was hot for about a year and a half. Then they start catching on fire. And so people that went into that market, like, you know, their business is just like, you know, Folded overnight, right? But that's something that personally I would have never done in the get go because I want to be able to have security to know that my business isn't going to go anywhere. It's very yeah. I, I really like your approach. It's, you bring a sort of an old school like sales mentality, and it's just common sense in a lot of ways about about getting into sustainable business models, getting into sustainable products, uh, and, and leveraging the most common sense way to do them, which is reach people in those stages of you know, interest in action rather than just trying to distract them on, on their Facebook feed. I still think you should be re- remarketing on Facebook, but then you won't, then you, then yeah, you, I might, I might, you Eric, know, you know, <laughs> the funny thing is that all my buddies that are like crushing it and like, you know, e and then marketing, they're like busting my chops right now, on not being on Facebook. So you guys, you guys might've done it, man. You might give me the edge to get on. That's awesome. So, I wanted to talk a little, little bit about like, you know, a lot of the people I talk to that are, that are rock, you know, they're trying to get to 20 and $30 AOVs. Like that's sort of the, that's where on Facebook you feel like, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be able to acquire users at still lower than that is getting difficult. Um, it's still doable obviously, but I wanted to know, so people that are, that are around that area of AOV, is there an opportunity with, with, with PLA and with Google specifically to compete at those kinds of prices? Like, is your strategy a supplemental strategy as well for people that, that are already killing Facebook ads? Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, I got a ton of people that I know that are leveraging uh, Google product listing ads um, with lower ticket products. You know, the thing is, is that, you know, again, just the thing is you can be able to control like the branded and, you know, the keyword terms that's driving traffic to your website. So going back to, you know, if you look at like the different types of traffic, and I'm pretty sure, you know, you've had tons of people probably explain this, how you got cold traffic, warm traffic, hot traffic, uh, you know, with Google, like you can really force them to send you like the warmest, hottest traffic to your website on your product listing ads for your products. So to really get a good, you know, ROI on that is just to make sure that the, the keyword terms that you're targeting, that you're really focusing on, you know, that type of traffic of like whatever it is that you're selling. Like, so, you know, what's, what's going to happen when you're running product listing ads is Google's going to create a keyword list that's going to tell you, hey, like these are the terms people are putting in and this is the amount of traffic that we're sending to you based off of these keywords. So let's say, for example, like you're selling, um, you know, let's just say dog t-shirts, right? You know, that that has like a lower AOV. So, you know, if you're getting traffic where put, people are putting in like, you know, Walmart dog t-shirts or Costco dog t-shirts. Like that's something that you need to add as a negative keyword because obviously you're not Walmart and obviously you're not Costco, right? But people are going and looking for that. So unless you have like, again, like another really unique, awesome, compelling offer that would convince someone that the purchase from you instead of Walmart, that would be a term that I would move over to the negative keyword bucket and not send that traffic because it's going to create a longer life cycle to acquire that customer versus like, you know, whatever type of dog t-shirt that you're selling, that that's the thing that you're actually bidding on. Yeah. That, that makes perfect sense. I'm always amazed uh, whenever I have these new conversations with people, just about how many different ways there are to skin a cat, you know, it's a weird expression, but basically like that, that ability to, to generate massive success in e-commerce 
by, by Levert being really good at Facebook ads, really good at product sourcing. And it's like, you don't always need all, of, as you're proving, you don't need all of these things. You need to be good at, at the fundamentals. I think that's one thing that your story really proves. You've got you've to gotta think about that customer mindset and you've got to think about providing a good customer experience. Those, those are the, the cores you can base it on. And then after that, you, you, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different avenues and areas that you can kind of excel in and you're, you're, you're living proof of that. Yeah, man. There's like, and there's so many ways for you to be able to, you know, buy media and buy traffic. Like there's just an unlimited source of being able to drive consumers to your website with your products. And it's it kind of like, I always kind of laugh a little bit on the inside, never to like people's face were like, I'm having issues driving traffic. I'm like, ow, like there's so much out there. There's so many people probably looking for what you want to sell. It's crazy. Yeah. But, what you said, man, just master yeah. one channel first and then move on to the next. So like if you're listening to this right now and you're just like, oh, man, you know, I've been running Facebook ads and they're not really working out or I've been driving traffic from Google and it's not really working out. Like, you know, it's probably because there's some other things that you, you need to increase your skill set. Right. That's what we're really getting to. Like you got to improve your skill set. And that's a lot of what Eric is offering at the Europe event that you guys need to go to is like how to be able to increase your skill set so you can start to master whatever it is that you're looking to do. And that's why they have all the different dynamic speakers. So. You know, getting into that now because we're talking about the event and I really want people to get a lot of value out of, you know, if they're going and even if they're not, you're going to another event is that don't try to take everything from everyone. Right. Figure out, like, look at your business and see what is the next logical thing that you need to do in order to get to where you want to go. So, like, if you're only making like ten thousand dollars a month, don't go into the mindset of like, oh, my God, I'm going to come out of here. I'm going to learn how to make a million dollars a month. That that that's going to be really challenging. But if you say, hey, I'm making 10 grand a month right now, how do I get to 20? And then look at like what you're doing well already in your business. Like what's your conversion rate? Is it at like a half a percent? Is it like 0.75 percent? Are you at 1 percent? Well, you know, if you're anything less than 1 percent, your goal should be like, how can I, you know, improve my conversion rate? So I, now I can really take advantage of the traffic that I'm driving to really create uh, an awesome experience for my customers to convert them. Right now, if you're already at like 1 percent, 2 percent and above now it's just like, you're probably looking at like, how can you drive more quality traffic to your website, right? And so, you know, just go with the, the mindset of like getting to the next best step for your business and not trying to really take everything from everyone, right? Now, people are probably going to drop nuggets. And if you get a nugget, definitely write it down and just take it for when you need it. But whatever it is that you need and prepare for that when you get there, because every single time I've ever gone to an event, the more prepared I am for what I'm looking to get out of the event is what I genuinely typically get out of the event, right? But when you don't have that mindset of what you're actually looking to get, you're just not going to be able to maximize it for somebody like myself. And it's not because you guys have been listening to this whole episode. I'm not doing anything crazy. Like, I'm not doing anything out of this world, like hokey dokey. You can't model what I'm doing. It's, uh, it's really fundamental, <laughs> right? And I'm just mastering the fundamentals at every single level. That, what a tagline right there. Mastering the fundamentals of every single level. The big, the big fundamental. That's what they call Tim Duncan, right? The big, the, the big, the big fundamental, uh, which, which is awesome. So speaking of big here, I, I think we maybe talked about this in the beginning here, but one of the, you know, I always, I, I, when we met, I'm like, I got to have you on the podcast. And then, then I got busy and everything. And then the, 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 the conference, uh, you know, ping me. Uh, affiliate world conferences, getting ready for affiliate world Europe as well. They're like, you got to talk to Ernest Epps again. You should see what his video is doing. His video on YouTube, drop ship your way to a six figure income without AliExpress and without Facebook actually should be in there too, to be extra, you know, hammered home at, at affiliate world Asia. This thing has 60,000 views. It has 58,000 views, which is like 10 times more than any other video that we've ever done really. What do you, how do you account for that? A, do you, do you have some, like, have you been, you got a bot network that's just hit, just hitting it? <laughs> or like, how do you account for this, that, that massive, massive spike in views? Oh uh, man, really? I think just, you know, the thing is, and I knew I did this was that, you know, when I really uh, got the opportunity to, you know, speak to the audience that you guys had there, I just want to deliver just so much value and just bring the right energy that I just knew that it would transfer over to anyone that got an opportunity to listen to the content. So I don't think, you know, again, back to the fundamentals, I just felt like I needed to give a really good presentation with the right type of energy and give the best content that would add the most value to people. And I, I really think like I really gave people like some good fundamental competencies that they could take from that presentation. And even though it was only 20 minutes, I, you know, I squeezed as much as I could. And actually your the presentation I did there, 
Um, <laughs> you probably wouldn't even like know this, but that was the presentation I worked the hardest on because I had the least amount of time. If you guys have been listening to this, I got so much stuff I could talk about, but I had the least amount of time. So I actually practiced. That was the first presentation I literally probably spent about four to six hours practicing on that presentation before I gave it. Cause I knew I had to like get in everything I could, but at the same time pace myself at a, at a decent pace where people could consume it, but also deliver it the right way. So yeah, man, that's, that's, that's all I can give it to man. <laughs> Just be fundamentally sound. And yeah, it's, it's unbelievable here. So I'm excited to see where this video goes. That's what I want. I, I want this thing to get 60,000 views as well. So let's work on that together here. Did you have any, Final thoughts for the audience here. I think, again, you have provided a ton of value here. You provided a new perspective, I think, one that we haven't really had on this, sh uh, on this show before. So I really appreciate it. Any final thoughts for the audience for, for what people ought to do? I think, first of all, you said something really interesting about, you know, going to a conference with an expectation. And I think that's, uh, that's true about life as well. I wanted to just call that, to, you know, and I think it's one of the hardest things to do in a way is to really like think about what you want and, and actually like make it a goal. I think so many people live their lives sort of like moving from thing to thing. Uh, and, and so few people take the time to really visualize what they want out of a situation. And I think it's like, isn't that the secret? Like that's like the key to everything basically is, is being able to really visualize what you want to have happen. And there, and then your subconscious can help kind of put it into place. Yeah, man, I heard a really unique concept and it's like really what I've been able to apply to, every different facet or industry that I've gone into, like whether I was working a nine to five and crushing it over there, or whether I was, you know, now building my e-com businesses and speaking on stage and things of that nature is like really start with the end in mind. Like exactly what Eric just said, like what, like, where do you want to actually get to? Like, what is like the ultimate goal? And, you know, if you're, if you, like, if you really genuinely don't feel good about it, like if it doesn't get you excited, if it doesn't like, you know, when you look at it, it's just like, oh, like I could possibly, I, could, I can do this. Like, if it's not there, like, if it doesn't do that for you, then it's probably the wrong goal. And the reason why I say that guys is because, you know, when we look back at, you know, we fast uh, rewind back three years ago when I first started, like I didn't believe I could build a million dollar like e-commerce empire. Right. Like that was just a figment of my imagination. Like I, I couldn't really I couldn't think that big. And the reason why, honestly, if I can just be transparent with you guys, is just because my self image was just really low. I mean, you know, I blew through all my savings. It was like a really you know hard time because like, you know, fiance was taking care of everything. We got kids. We're actually living in a one bedroom basement apartment because, you know, I wasn't providing like I should have been. And so that was a really challenging season. So personally myself, I can honestly tell you like a million dollars was definitely nowhere near my thought process. Really like my first big goal was to get, to make 10 sales in a month. Like that was my first big goal and to have an, uh, an AOV of $400. Like that was my first like average order value, 400 bucks. And to have 10 sales come in for the month, because I knew I would, you know, net about $1,500 to $1,800 off of that. And so that, that was my first initial goal. And like, when I wrote down my list, and I wish I had my notebook with me, I, I carried around a green notebook with me. And that's why I wrote everything down as I was going through my journey. And the first goal was to make one sale. The next goal was to make two sales. <laughs> so a total of three sales. Then the next goal was to, you know, make 10 sales in a month, right? It wasn't it, this this crazy esoteric, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to kill it. You know, even listening to like the amazing speakers that I think I've grown into, like I wouldn't have been able to consume everything that I'm even saying now back then. And so I don't know if anyone's listening right now is like in that place. And if you're in that place, it's okay. Like, it's okay that, you know, whatever season that you're in right now, that you're not able to, you know, really mentally, you know, put yourself in that like million dollar thought process. But start where, where you're at and pick a goal that, you know, gets you excited and really get you going, get the get the juices flowing because you're going to need something other than like really good content to make this thing happen. Because once you get started, you know, life is going to come along and it's going to challenge that decision that you had getting started. And for me, that challenge was and I kind of rarely share the stories, but, you know, once I actually decided to uh, to get started and, you know, I got I had a couple sales coming in. You know, uh, I actually ended up losing every single one of my vehicles at that point, like e-commerce stores going, you know, I'm working, you know, we got multiple streams of income coming in now. Life is going great. I'm on this like high of life. And then 
uh, the Honda Civic that I was driving, all cap came off while I was driving down the highway. All started spewing all over the place. Engine caught on fire practically. I had my three kids in the back seat. Had to pull over. My mom had to come pick me up. The head gasket cracked on a PT Cruiser we had. Uh, a Toyota Camry. I literally went outside and it was like life was just like we got you, Ernest, because it wouldn't turn. <laughs> right? It's just like. We're going to take away all your means for transportation because you got to go an hour one way. Your fiance has to go an hour one way. And we're going to challenge that decision that you made of building this business and staying true to what you said that you wanted for yourself. And so in that season, you know, the only thing I told myself was don't let what you can't do stop you from what you can do. So I looked at my entire business that my, my little business at the time. Right. <laughs> I said, well, you already got everything up and going. You got a $29 a month Shopify fee. Like, you know, you can afford to cover that. The biggest, the biggest thing for me was like ads. Like, oh my God, I'm going to afford to spend money for traffic. And I was like, well, again, with that philosophy, don't let what you can't do stop you from what you can do. I said, you know what? I might not be able to afford a hundred dollars a day or $50 a day, but I can afford $5. <laughs> I can afford $2. Right. And, uh, and I was just like, all right, I'm just going to turn it down to five dollars per day. And I just work with that budget for, um, you know, for the next couple of weeks. And literally because I stayed faithful just with that one thing, you know, shortly after I made that decision, because we didn't have any money saved up at this time. Actually, the little bit of money that we had, I took it and I actually bought another course because I was buying courses at this point in time. So I took like fifteen hundred dollars and I bought another course and I didn't even tell my fiance I blew that money. So she had no idea. She's just kind of like, because I was, I handled most of the finances and stuff. Like, hey, can we go get another car? Can we do a down payment? I'm like, hey, babe, we ain't got nothing. And so uh, I got a sale for like thirty five, almost four hundred dollars or four thousand dollars, and the profit from that gave me enough to be able to go to the dealership and to be able to get a, a vehicle. Actually, the Kia Soul that I'm driving to this day was financed from that one drop shipping sale to get things going. That's a really cool story. I think it's a cool cap on our on our talk today here. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Ernest. If people want to get in touch with you, they can go to ErnestEpps.com. I know you're active on Facebook. Uh, how else can people get in touch with you if they want? Yeah, man. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, you know, LinkedIn. I'm everywhere. Pinterest, <laughs> the whole nine yards. So, uh, yeah, guys, make sure you check out that YouTube video that uh, Eric talked about, man, because I give some phenomenal content. And really, I would challenge you guys to make sure you listen to this episode again, man, because, you know, Eric really pulled out some really good gems from me today. Um, you know, make sure that you guys go out and check out the uh, the Europe event that uh, Eric and the, and, the, and the organization is promoting because, man, I'm telling you, they got some rock stars that's going to be there. And I just, man, I just pray with every fiber of my being that you guys really take all the stuff that Eric is putting out here in the universe and through these podcasts and, you know, YouTube channels and really apply it because it can really, truly, genuinely change your life and you can get whatever it is that you want. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks a lot, Ernest. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, Eric.